everyone and welcome to chapter 3.4. This is immobilized enzymes. Now, what are immobilized enzymes exactly? Now, enzymes, immobilized enzymes are attached to an inert, insoluble material. This can happen multiple ways. Um, it could be like adsorption, so directly sticking to a surface, covalent bonding, so somehow in the lab they manufacture this bonding here together with an inert material. It could be encapsulation into some sort of jelly bead kind of thing, which we will learn today. And cross-linking, just linking them together so that you know it clumps together and doesn't go everywhere. Anyways, yeah, we primarily focus on the encapsulate method um, and pre more precisely, how to encapsulate enzymes in alginate beads. This is what we cover in our syllabus only. So yeah, how do we do that? Let's look at this little diagram here. Number one, we mix the enzymes with sodium alginate. So the enzymes is here together with the sodium alginate in the syringe. We mix them up, we suck it up with a syringe, and we add it drop by drop into calcium chloride. Now what happens here is that those alginate beads start to form. Uh, alginate, sodium alginate and calcium chloride forms a complex which is insoluble and therefore they become these beads. They are beautiful things by the way. I hope you get to do the experiment. Now what do we do with these beads? We take them and we pack them into a column. What's a column? Um, usually we take a string and we pull out the plunger and then we put like a little mesh at the bottom and we pack those alginate beads into uh, the string and we call it a column. But of course the industrial size ones will be much bigger. Anyways, yeah, um, this column would contain all the alginate beads and what we're going to do is we're going to run substrates through the column. So we can see some um, examples here below right the idea is you have enzyme again in those alginate beads in the column you have glucose solution uh, which is the substrate here and you run glucose through the column and the enzymes here would catalyze the reaction and products will come up from the bottom in this case the product not written here is fructose uh, and this process is really used in the production of corn syrup, okay? High fructose corn syrup. It's a very, like, um, American thing. Anyways, yeah, this is for corn syrup. Let's look at another example here um, with milk. So milk containing lactose here is a substrate. Actually, the substrate is just lactose. Uh, and the enzyme used here is a lactase. It's immobilized in these alginate beads. And you can see how milk containing lactose can be poured through the top. And what comes out is lactose-free milk. So that lactose intolerant people, mostly Asians, can drink this. Now, although the ideal situation is that, that we will get 100% yield, so 100% lactose-free milk, but this is actually quite impossible, right? This is not very possible at all, okay? Um, honestly, the yield isn't that high, but we can increase yield, increase percentage yield by running the products through the column again and again. So for example, this is 50% lactose-free milk because it's not very efficient. But we, however, we can take this milk, we can take this product and pour it through the column again in order to increase that percentage of lactose-free milk. Or might I say, decrease the concentration of lactose. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, um, you can do this again and again. You can incubate it for longer as well. So don't run it through so fast. Like close this off, leave it there for like 30 minutes and then maybe you get a higher percentage yield as well. So yes, that's immobilized enzymes uh, and this is how they are being used as well. So the question that really remains is why do I have to learn this? Why use immobilized enzymes anyway? Why do industries love it? 
Now, this is why those enzymes can be easily reused because they are separate from the product and it's really easy to get them back uh, and the enzyme can have a longer shelf life. And also, there's less purification downstream processing needed because as we said just now, as I said a little bit just now, it keeps the product enzyme free. So again, the enzyme and product are separate. So this doesn't affect the product quality. It doesn't affect the product's taste. Um, yeah, so you don't need to do all that. Uh, therefore, we don't need to worry about all those different processes. We can just continuously produce again and again using the same column. And this really is an efficient process which results in more product per unit time. Okay, and one more benefit about the product and enzyme being separate is if there is end product inhibition that's occurring, it reduces that entirely. So the product is definitely separate from the enzyme, therefore it doesn't interact. Now perhaps the best part about immobilized enzymes is this. The enzymes become more tolerant of pH changes, so it doesn't care about pH that much, not as sensitive, and it is more tolerant of temperature, so it is thermal stable, less likely to denature at high temperature. And this means we can increase the temperature a little bit higher to speed up the reactions, but our enzymes won't denature so quickly. This is a, like such like an important feature of immobilized enzymes. Now, why? Why are they tolerant to pH and temperature? Now, again, the alginate beads encapsulate the enzyme. And therefore, alginate kind of protects the enzyme. The enzyme would be less exposed to a solution, and for p in the in in the sense of pH, when there is low pH, there's a lot of hydrogen ions, right? When there's high pH, there's a lot of hydroxide ions, right? These these hydrogen or hydroxide ions can penetrate cannot penetrate the alginate beads as much. Okay, less of them penetrate and therefore the active site of the immobilized enzyme is less destructive and less likely to denature. The 3D structure of the enzyme is also stabilized because of the way the alginate holds onto it and therefore at high temperature hydrogen bonds will vibrate less and therefore fewer bonds break and therefore active site is again less likely to change shape and less denaturation occurs you can see this in this cute graph over here how immobilized lipase so lipase breaks down lipids um, how immobilized lipase activity compares to free lipase activity at different ph now at ph 7 we can see that it's the optimum pH for free lipase, but we can see how um, immobilized lipase has a higher activity at every single pH, and its optimum is a wider range because it is simply more stable. Yeah, so yeah, that is why immobilized enzymes are great. And that is the end of the chapter. Now just a reminder to look at the chapter outline to figure out what is in the chapter and what you should be learning. And there's always useful videos right at the end of each slideshow I made. So yeah, that's all. Um, that's all we're going to be talking about for enzymes. Bye-bye.